Welcome to Opolis TV. I'm in Johannesburg in South Africa together with Michael Chax. He is a portfolio manager of Coro Capital, an established equity long short hedge fund manager here in South Africa. And Michael, please tell us more about your background, your history and more about Coro Capital. I started my career almost 10 years ago in hedge funds with a company that hosted two funds, a long short equity fund and a market neutral fund, and basically cut my teeth during the 2008 financial crisis. My background before that, um, I qualified as a chartered accountant in 2003. Subsequent to that, I qualified as a chartered financial analyst. Um, I worked in many various ad advisory roles for a period of time until making the move into hedge funds. And I've been in the industry since. Having joined Cora Capital about five years ago, going on five and a half years now, the environment that I arrived at was not quite a hedge fund environment. It was more of a proprietary trading environment where we invested balance sheet, balance sheet funds. To give you some history about Cora Capital, um, Cora Capital was part of a large listed group back in the early 2000s. The same listed group that unbundled the now famous Coronation Fund Managers in 2003. We were the remainder unlisted subsidiary company and the company continued for a period of about 12 years um, with a private equity and a trading on. I joined um, at the tail end of 2011 and, and I head up the proprietary trading division and over a period of time I helped formalize that division into more of a portfolio or fund type approach and the ultimate goal was always to transition it into a third party asset management business. So over a process of two years um, we, we planned, uh, we got the necessary regu regulatory licenses in place and we formally launched the fund at the beginning of 2016 on the 1st of February. Quite a difficult year to, to launch a fund given the uncertainty in the world and particularly in South Africa and the political turmoil that's taken place here. But we believe that the fund has performed quite well in the environment. So we launched at the beginning of 2016. And essentially, we still had to transition the portfolio from a proprietary trading balance sheet based model into a fund based model. And there were a few lessons to learn along the way. But I think over the last six months, we've revi refined our processes and we're in a portfolio with holdings that we really like at the moment. We think it's a, it's a sufficiently liquid portfolio and we think that it's a highly marketable portfolio with assets that we've deployed capital into that are likely to generate good returns over the next two to three years. When we set out to launch the fund, we paid a lot of attention to what the funds in South Africa had done correctly. So I personally did a lot of research into hedge funds and the good hedge funds and the bad hedge, fund, hedge funds and what underlined the good performers and the poor performers. And essentially what I found was that the funds that tended to perform best were funds that had strong fundamental bottom-up analysis, fundamental analysis, and that employed senior experienced analysts. Typically you found there were a number of funds in, South, in the South African market who tried to build scale at the expense of quality and perhaps hired a, a high number of analysts that were relatively inexperienced straight out of varsity and those funds have typically struggled in the last 24 months. So we took a deliberate strategy to make sure that we have quality expertise in-house rather than quantity and to start a single fund as opposed to multiple funds to start off with to ensure that we could give the correct amount of impetus and focus on the fund to ensure that the first flagship fund was a success. In South Africa, there isn't really much room for, for, for multi-strategy funds, although we do like a multi-strategy approach. We find that 
given the dominance of fund of funds in South Africa, they don't like the asset allocation decision to be taken away from them. So what we had to do is position the fund as a long short fund with the mandate open enough to invest across asset classes. But our predominant focus is equities and particularly in South Africa. The fund structure that we've gone with given the new CIS regulations is a trust structure. We find that the, the regulatory environment in South Africa, whilst quite onerous, provides a lot of downside protection for investors. There's a high level of oversight and a high level of comfort for investors to know that you've got more than one layer of risk management at any given time. Risk management is an incredibly important part of our approach and there are numerous layers to our risk management function. The first of which is the way in which we structure the portfolio. We've deliberately taken an approach to run a low correlation to the all share index. So in, in picking the individual investments, we need to understand the, the impact that that will have on the overall portfolio beta and the way that the portfolio is likely to respond when, market, when the market moves in either direction. And I'd like to defer your attention to slide number nine, where you can see the dispersion of the daily returns between the fund. The orange dots are the daily returns on the fund since inception, whilst the blue dots are the daily returns on, on, on the overall market. And you can see how nicely clustered the orange dots are towards the middle, showing much lower volatility overall in the fund. In the fund. What's also very important is the manner in which you invest your assets in a portfolio. We do not believe in, in using high levels of gearing to, gener to generate returns. We believe that individual investment decisions should stand up on their own and should give you the requisite returns without gearing them up. So we typically run a fairly low level of gearing in the portfolio. The other important um, part to risk management is managing your trading disciplines. So setting predefined stop losses when entering into a trade and understanding what your maximum loss potential is on every trade and setting a loss appetite for that particular trade. As much as we'd like to think that every trade we're going to put on is going to make money, and um, I think everybody that's been in the markets knows that certain trades don't make money. And the question is, is what do you do in that environment? So we take stop losses very seriously. And on top of that, we have a fourth layer of risk management, which is a safety net, if you like, which is our risk committee. We have bi-monthly risk committee meetings where our investment committee take a look at all of our positions in the portfolio and critically analyze them for risk based on current market conditions, potential um, fat-tailed risk events. And we have a look at our exposures with a fresh eye um, every two weeks, to two to four weeks, and make decisions as to what we'd like those exposures to go for, to, to be going forwards. We're a hedge fund, and by definition, we're supposed to hedge. Um, we have a number of techniques that we use to hedge the portfolio with varying degrees of success in, 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 in different types of circumstances. So one has to understand in which circumstances certain hedges are more appropriate than others. So, for example, Brexit that happened towards the end of June. It was a single day event uh, that had what was a binary outcome. Going into an event like that, it was very difficult to take any type of review, um, but one needed to understand that if a negative outcome happened, which it did, um, how the portfolio was likely to behave. In an instance like that, we favor hedges that will um, provide protection or potentially spike in the event of a volatile market circumstance or an uncertain market, ha market happening. In this particular in instance, we, um, into the two, three weeks building up to Brexit, we increased our holding in gold positions. And obviously on the day, the gold price spiked quite significantly and it protected our portfolio to quite a high degree. The other way that we look at hedging is by buying volatility. So we find a unique circumstance in South Africa is that it's quite difficult to short the overall index. And the reason that it's difficult to short the overall index is that you've only got 40 stocks in it. And within those 40 stocks, you've got four to five stocks that carry almost a 50% weighting of that index. And typically they're defensive inward listing names that have a high RAND hedge quality. So if you want to short your, hedge your portfolio by shorting the index, you're actually shorting five stocks, um, which is 
provides limited downside protection in certain instances, particularly where the RAND tends to blow out. So we found a far more efficient way to hedge the portfolio is to buy volatility when it's cheap. And basically how we do that is we look to buy options, call options on the market when the volatility is quite cheap and we hedge out the delta exposure on those options, which is typically your index positions. And what you've got left is an outright long exposure to volatility. So if you have a fat tail event or a systemic event like a Brexit or where Donald Trump won the election in, in earlier in November, you tend to make money on your long volatility because the volatility increases on these positions. The third way or the second way of hedging that we look at is to sell positions. So if we're particularly concerned about the stock markets and we don't think um, either gold or a volatility, volatility position is the correct way to hedge the portfolio, we'll try and reduce our overall exposure and try and sit in cash for a period of time. And then sort of a more longer term basis of hedging is by employing short equity positions, so standalone positions. And typically how we do that, being a bottom up fundamental based house, as part of the normal research process when we research companies to buy, we often find companies that we don't like or companies where we think that the business model or industry is in a particular bad space and will employ short positions in those stocks. But typically, those are not hedges against market volatility. They are um, hedges against existing long positions and sometimes an outright trading position in their own right where we think that um, our fundamental view um, when uh, when there's a catalyst like an earnings an earnings announcement um, will be vindicated and will tend to make money on those short positions. So Michael, how can I invest? What types of funds, what types of structures do you offer? At this point in time, we've only got the one fund, which is our flagship fund. Given that we launched at the beginning of February, we thought we'd give it at least a period of 12 months to raise assets in this particular fund and um, before we're looking at launching other fund structures. Two particular structures that we are planning to launch in the future, um, 12 to 24 months out, one being a mirror fund, which would basically replicate in dollars what we do locally here in SA, and the second one being a long only unit trust type fund, which is basically just exposure on the long side. As far as the existing fund goes, the structure is a trust structure. It falls under the new CIS legislation in South Africa. And as an investor, you would own a unit trust or a percentage of the trust in your own name. From a tax perspective, it's quite an efficient structure in that you don't pay tax on returns until you sell your investment in the fund, at which point you'll be liable for capital gains tax. Michael, please tell us more about your specific investment process at Coro Capital. A step before that question is what, are, what is our investment philosophy? I think as I may have touched on earlier, we're a bottom-up fundamental analysis shop. What that means is, is that we try to find good companies and invest in those. What makes a good company, you might ask, we believe what makes a good company are companies with exceptional management teams, high degree of earnings visibility over time, and a robust business model that can perform in different types of economic conditions. So those are the types of businesses that we look for. In terms of our investment process, it's quite research intensive. We spend a lot of time doing financial modeling and outside of the financial modeling, we look to get management interactions as far as possible, which includes one-on-one -on -one meetings, site visits. We engage with their customers, with their suppliers. We very often do a full, full due diligence on the company before making a decision to invest. And as part of this process, we look at the, 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 the quality of the management team, the individuals, their background, because at the end of the day, when you're investing in a company, you're investing in individuals. So this is quite important. This is quite an important part of our investment thesis. As a second part of the investment thesis, we need to really carefully understand the, the industry dynamics, the competitive dynamics at play, and also against the backdrop of the regulatory environment that they're playing, to try and understand what are the potential pitfalls for the investment or for the company, and to also try and understand what their motives when I speak of a moat, I speak of a 
in the olden days, if you look at the castles that were built, they were built with a moat around them, which provided a degree of protection from enemies. That's the type of investment case we look at. We look for companies that have some type of a natural physical moat around them that would protect them across economic cycles. So as you can see, we do a lot of thorough research on the company itself and we take a view on whether or not the company is a good company. But there's another step to that. A good company is not always a good investment. And this comes down to issues such as entry and exit levels and the valuation of a stock. So we don't buy stocks just because they're a good company. If the valuation is excessive, surely we won't enter. So what we pride ourselves in is that we, we pay a lot of attention to market momentum indicators. So when we're looking at a potential investment, it's not only the fundamental analysis deciding whether or not it's a good company, it's having a look at the other market dynamics. So for, for instance, what percentage shareholding is held by foreigners? And understanding where the source of the foreigners' capital comes from and their funding requirements or their return on capital requirements will help you to better understand the valuation dynamics of a stock. We also look at um, the nature of the shareholders and the potential for those shareholders to have to sell or exit at a, at, at a point in time or the potential for them to increase their stakes. And we look at the overall market. You know, if we take a view that the overall market is quite expensive at a point in time, it might be prudent to sit back and wait a little bit for a better entry level because at the end of the day, investing in good companies doesn't generate alpha. Investing in good companies at the right times is what generate, generates alpha. And conversely, exiting those investments at the right times is also critically important. We generate returns based on the entry point and the exit point of an investment, both on the long and short side. So Michael, tell us more about your investment universe. What do you invest in and is it mostly South African? Matthias, we're sitting on the south, in the southern tip of Africa, in South Africa. Our competitive advantage is in South Africa, our knowledge base is in South Africa. We feel that before we look offshore, we need to fully capitalize on the opportunities and the knowledge base that we have here. That's our competitive advantage. We do look offshore from time to time, but typically in stocks that are undercovered or under-researched, as we don't think that we could have any type of competitive research advantage on funds that are sitting in the same country as those target, target companies. What's also a very interesting dynamic in the South African market is that South African companies have been really good at diversifying geographically over the past years. One only has to look at the second largest brewer in the world that's recently been bought out by Anheuser Bush, SAB Miller. SAB Miller was started in South Africa and became the second largest brewer and one of the largest companies by market cap in the world. There are a number of South African companies that have looked to diversify their SA specific and political risk by diversifying their businesses and growing offshore. So typically what we try to do is we try to find management teams that have a competency in doing that and we back those management teams and that's how we prefer to get our overseas exposure. As far as asset classes go, we have the ability to invest across asset classes, although our primary focus is on equities. We can invest in fixed income. We have done it successfully in the past. There is a time to invest in convertible type instruments. There are arbitrage opportunities between convertible instruments and equities that we like to explore from time to time. And there are times to invest in commodities as well, commodities like gold and PGMs. We understand the PGM space really well, given that 70% of world supply comes out of South Africa. It very much is a South African story. And from time to time, we will look to explore these asset classes. Michael, tell us also more about your team. Matthias, we have a team of six investment professionals, three of which are dedicated full-time to the fund, and three of which would sit outside of the fund structure, but who sit with us on a day-to-day -day basis. These six professionals have a collective investment experience of over 100 years between them. And they also form our investment committee. We have an investment committee meetings every two to four weeks where we critically analyze the portfolio and discuss ideas and there's idea generation. But more importantly, we have investment thresholds that require investment committee approval at certain levels. So for any one investment that exceeds a 3% weighting in the portfolio, we need sign off from our investment committee. We've got checks and balances in place to ensure that we've covered every potential angle of an investment case.